Okay, and our financial acumen podcast topic for today is what are the steps to design effective sales compensation packages? So I'm thrilled to introduce Mark Bonolo, founder and CEO of Sales Globe, a leading sales effectiveness consulting and innovation firm focused on designing and implementing strategies for revenue growth. Mark is focused on helping leaders rethink their sales challenges and has decades of hands-on experience helping companies and leaders with a focus on data-driven, creative problem solving to reach new levels of performance. Mark's expertise is far reaching, spanning multiple industries and work environments, including sales strategy, sales organization, sales process, deployment, strategic account planning, incentive compensation, and quota setting. Mark is the author of books, The Innovative Sale, Quotas, What Your CEO Needs to Know About Sales Compensation, and Essential Account Planning. Mark hosts the Rethink Sales Podcast and is a certified LinkedIn learning instructor. His course, Analytics Driven Storytelling, is available on LinkedIn Learning. Mark holds an MBA from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Trail, Chapel Hill, and a BFA from the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. Mark speaks on sales and marketing topics and has been published in numerous business periodicals and books. Mark, I'm so thrilled to have you on the show. This is going to be a fantastic session. I've known you now. We were just catching up for close to, you know, 13 or 14 years now. So yeah, yeah. it's happy to to uh, connect and uh, and do this session together, Mark. Thank you. Glad to be here with you, Richard. Thanks for having me on. And uh, yeah, the 13 or 14 years, uh, it's it's hard to believe, but um yeah, time, time flies. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And so, Mark, look, just to kick it off, sales compensation, I, I, I learned in the U.S. is an 800, 800 billion per annum spend. It's three times the U.S. spend on advertising in businesses. So it, it's, a, it's a big ticket. And, um, you know, again, over my decades of, of being in business as a CFO, I know this is one of the biggest areas that businesses struggle with. So we're going to lean on your expertise. You're going to share some wisdom bites. And uh, if you're good, we'll get going. All right. All right. And that is a big spin. And actually, uh, one of the points you mentioned in the book, what your CEO needs to know about sales compensation is it is one of the biggest single line items that the organization uh, spends on. And and it's uh, it's critical to get it right because it's really the connection point between the C-level uh, corner office or sea level within any part of the organization, running regions, et cetera, and the front line. So it's a super critical connection. And I know this has been tough. As I said, many businesses, you know, struggle to get this right. So let's get going then. So, so Mark, why is designing an effective sales compensation plan so important for businesses? Well, I think it's um, it, it's critical because it is one of the most visible uh, connection points uh, between the the uh, company itself and what I call the C-level goals. Uh, so big priorities around markets that we're focusing on, what we're selling, uh, our coverage model, our financials, our talent. So it's one of the most visible connection points between those priorities and what people are doing on the front line. And so, it, it, you know, that that is the one thing they will they will listen to. The other thing they will listen to is their sales manager. I'm sure we'll talk about the role of management as we go as well. But but it is a critical uh, communications device. And that's what I you know think about sales compensation it, it, at its essence. It's a communication tool. Uh, so it's a very expensive communication tool. But what we're trying to do is get a message across to the sales organization about here are the things that are important to do that are important to the company that you have control over. And then we were, we we're going to reward you for that. Absolutely. And, and motivate our sales folks. You don't have a business unless we have sales. And so the struggle is, is, and we're going to get into how you design the comp plan. The struggle is, is how do I motivate my frontline sales folks? Okay. And, and all the way up to sales management to be able to, you know, enable the, the company goals. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. All right. So with that, what are the steps to design an effective sales compensation plan? Mark? Wow. Okay. So that's not an easy answer, but I can give you kind of a, uh, an overview, I think, in terms of how you should, how you should think about it. So the first thing you want to do with sales compensation is you need to understand its context within 
the broader what I call revenue roadmap in terms of how the company operates around uh, how it sells. And what I mean by that is when you think about this idea of revenue roadmap, um, and it's something we go into in, in the book, it, it looks at four major competency areas. And one of those includes sales compensation, but the, the areas are insight or understanding what's going on in the market with your customers, uh, with your competitors, which then informs our sales strategy, which is our overall go-to-market plan, which then is put into action by what we think of as the coverage model, which has to do with the channels and the sales roles and the sales process and our territories, our account assignments. And then finally, it's got a layer we call the enablement layer, which basically supports all of the decisions that are made in those upstream disciplines. So the enablement layer includes uh, people and technology programs. Uh, uh, so it's got you know training and talent and and you know uh, uh, technology CRM et cetera. But that's where incentive compensation and quotas sit. So first step is understand the fit or the context of how sales compensation fits into those other areas because what you're trying to design to or maybe what you're trying to address in terms of challenges may not be sales compensation issues or uh, proper or challenges proper, they may be related to other things. So you have to understand, you know, is our um, is, is our sales process lined up the right way? Are the jobs doing what they need to do? Are they defined correctly? Because if you don't, the sales compensation plan will usually trigger those questions because a lot of times the, the reason the sales compensation plan doesn't work is because some of those things haven't been answered. So first of all, check your context. Like how, how does, how do you fit? How does your plan fit within the overall decisions you're making? Uh, second big step, as I mentioned or alluded to before, is understanding what your C-level goals are. So the big areas of what's important from a, a customer standpoint, and that could include things like uh, segments, buyer levels, buyer types, and where do we want to focus? What's uh, important from an offer standpoint? So what products or services may be priorities? Uh, what's important from an organization uh, and role standpoint, talent standpoint, and also, of course, you being a CFO, what's important from a financial standpoint. So if we can if we can get good answers to those five areas, then, and we also understand the context of where sales compensation is sitting in the revenue roadmap, then we have a good foundation that we can start from to design the plan. And then you're going to, when you design the plan, get into a few major areas. Uh, the first thing you do with the compensation plan, ironically, is you don't start working on the commission rates or the pay curves, because that's what people jump to immediately. They want to they want to get right in and say, well, you know, if we put an accelerator here or maybe a threshold there, well, that's actually step number seven. But it, it falls into uh, about um, uh, 12 different steps, but they're they're really in four big areas. So one is, is your plan framing, which is the components around your target pay, your pay mix, which has to do with how your roles are and the strategy they're following your upside potential and your thresholds or entry points in the plan. So that's kind of section number one. Section number two is, is linking pay and performance together. So we get into those questions of what are we measuring on? Uh, are we measuring revenue, profit, product mix? And those questions are very often answered by what the job controls of the C-level goals. You get into questions of uh, the levels and timing of your measurement. And of course, your mechanics at that point. And then you get into aligning the team and financials, kind of part number three. So uh, how do we make sure all the jobs are working together? Uh, how do we set goals? And then you get into how do you operate the plan? So um, how do we implement? What kind of policies do we need? Uh, what kind of governance do we need? Um, how do we monitor and manage the plan ongoing? So, uh, so in a few minutes there, those are all like the big considerations. Now, that's probably a you know, a two day seminar to go through all those, but those are kind of as, as a flyover, those are the big things that you would want to look at in terms of making sure you have the revenue roadmap, the C level goals, and those components, we refer to those, the uh, sales comp diamond components, those components, having all those aligned, those are your major steps. Absolutely. So we're going to unpack some of that now, because this is where the, this is where the rubber meets the road now, Mark, right? So what I'm hearing in the first part that you, you just mentioned is we've got to define clear objectives. All right. right. The, the sales compensation, your sales process have got to align with your strategic objectives. And that's got to be a vehicle to, um, you know, to drive those outcomes and the right behaviors. What I also heard is about segmenting your sales team up. All right. You mm -hmm. can have inside sales, field sales, 
account executives, account managers. So there are different compensation structures, essentially, for each of those types of, of roles in a business, right? So the compensation right. plans may vary according to those. But in my experience, and you guided me this 13 years ago, I don't know if you remember, because you've had hundreds of clients and customers, you know, I'm sure. But um, I think one of the first places we started, Mark, was gather your market data. You know, what, 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 one of the things, and you, you'll, you'll talk about is, is if we start with kind of what is the market bearing, right, mm -hmm. in your particular industry, right? And so I know when, even when we've, when we've had sales executives, you know, there's a certain context to your point where you say, okay, the market data, a full package for X, Y, Z position is about this amount. And then you then mm -hmm. we can then we're gonna start to kind of unpack everything else about how you truly design that. But is that still because things have changed a lot in the past decade or so? Is getting a kind of market driven data approach by saying this is this is what the curve looks like. People are at the median, they're on they're on the laggard or they're the leader part, but you get some kind of context as to if you want to have a competitive package, what does it look like in as a total compensation package? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say uh, the market data is critical insight. I think the potential trap in that is relying that on that as your potential answer or your answer, uh, meaning we want to know the data points in terms of uh, competitive pay. So the key pieces you're going to be looking at are your uh, um, TTC, target total compensation, yes. which would be target, right? So that's your base salary and incentive at target. Uh, you also want to understand what your um, your highs are in terms of the top uh, pay. You want to understand the lows, obviously. Uh, you want to understand the salaries and the incentive portion. So if you understand salary at those levels, you can um, interpret what the incentive portion is going to be. You can also interpret what the upside is for your for your top performers if you're looking at the max, maximum numbers in the market. Uh, so you'd be looking at those in terms of the market data in terms of the targets and then also the actuals, because sometimes the actuals can be different than the targets in the market. Uh, if you have really good quality market data, and we can talk about data sources because you can buy published sources, but or you can also do a, a custom competitor survey uh, you could get information on what kind of per, uh, performance measures are being used. So are they paying on revenue, profit, uh, uh, bookings, et cetera. Uh, and you may be able to get information on how some of the mechanics work. So are they uh, commission-based or rate-based plans? Are they goal-based plans? So uh, a lot of it depends on the market data sources that they're using. But that said, the real when I say there's there's a uh, a trap in it and in that you can be tempted to look at that as the answer. So therefore, here's what we might do. What you need to do, what companies need to do is they need to step back and try to understand what are we trying to solve for. Yes. So what's the problem we're trying to solve for? If it's a problem that has to do with pay disparity, so we're not paying as much as the market, or maybe our base salaries are lower than the market but our incentive levels are higher, whatever it might be, then the market data is val valid and, and valuable, right? But we have to determine what we're trying to solve for because we might be trying to solve for, let's, let's throw market data in here. We might be trying to solve for an issue like we have high turnover and we have high turnover in our sales team that maybe are the people that are experienced. So they stay around for a couple of years, 24 months, but maybe after 24 months, we start to see higher turnover. Well, why is that? Well, it's because competitors are paying more. So you pull the market data, you see, well, in some places, competitors are paying more. Well, the answer to your problem, the solution may not be just paying more, but it may be around other value proposition components. It may be, well, yeah, but what about what we're doing in terms of benefits or affiliation with our company, which maybe has a great brand or maybe career opportunities or or work content, right? So there are a number of things that go into the employee value proposition, compensation being only one of them. So the reason I bring that up when you when you mentioned market data is um, we, we see that often, which is we need to change our pay levels. But then when we look at it, we see that the client we're working with maybe has some other things that they're not promoting as much that people really do value. So you can go take a job in another place that you're getting paid more potentially, or uh, you may actually, you know, may, may not have the, the the job quality or job content 
that you're looking for, the culture that you're looking for. That that's an important answer as well. Um, and then last point, market data. It's important to look at uh, objective data because the numbers that you'll hear when people talk about competitor A is paying more is you will hear the anecdotal information. So it's like when people are you know trading stocks and they're they're day trading on Schwab or you know E Trade or whatever. You only hear about when they make money, right? You don't hear about how much they lost, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, so yeah. you'll hear about all the, the stories of how much people are getting paid, but you're not hearing the stories about maybe what they're not getting paid. Or you'll hear that they have higher pay levels, but what you don't realize is that they're not really hitting their quotas. So people aren't seeing those higher pay levels. So there are a lot of things behind the data that you really have to dig into. Got it. Okay. I gotcha. And, and really well said. Thank you for that. It is a benchmark. We're doing market research for some context. And you started to lead into the real nuts and bolts now, which is choosing the right compensation structure. It mentioned, you know, base salary, maybe some variable pay, potentially bonuses, maybe some other stuff. How do we decide on the various mix of those components? Well, your first step is going to be looking at the next big component, which is your base salary and target incentive. Uh, so if you take base salary plus target incentive, a target incentive would be what somebody would earn at target for hitting quota or yeah. meeting um, some expectation. Uh, that that ratio uh, or that, that total is called what I referred to before, TTC or target total compensation or companies have different terms, target total cash so they're, or OTE on target earnings. So there are different languages used in different companies, but that ratio is called pay mix or salary incentive mix. So a pay mix, if let's, let's take a hundred thousand dollar TTC, uh, if somebody has a seventy thousand dollar base salary and a thirty 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 thousand dollar target incentive, that's a seventy thirty pay mix. So that pay mix is going to be probably one of your biggest drivers of behavior in the sales organization, and and here's why: because that ratio can affect how somebody acts because it can increase or decrease the level of urgency or the level of relationship building or the level of patience they have in the sales process. So for example, if if, uh, if you had a, let's just talk hypothetically. So I said, Richard, you get you got a TTC of $100,000. You go, okay, well, that's that's too little. Why do I do it? But, but $100,000. And we said, you've got a you got an 80-20 pay mix. You get $80,000 base salary, $20,000 target incentive. Uh, but Richard, you know, we're implementing a new compensation program. So it's actually going to go to a 60-40, $60,000 base salary, $40,000 incentive. All of a sudden, you're going to ask me questions like, you know, after the expletives come out, you're going to ask me questions like, I don't know, what, why am I sitting here? I don't have time to have this conversation. I've got to get out and sell something, right? Because your level of urgency went up because your, your pay at risk just went up. Right. So that's a big driver of behavior. So you have to get that right. What you need to do is you need to align it to the sales roles. So I'll talk in some general terms here. The uh, If you take a hunter or what we call in our canine model, the Doberman, yeah. and you take a, a farmer or what we call in our canine model, the retriever, those are going to have different pay mixes. Usually the hunter will have a more aggressive pay mix. Say it's 50-50, so $50,000 base salary, 50% incentive. And the in the farmer or the maybe the retriever might have a 70 30 uh, or 75 25 pay mix. And the reason is we're trying to promote different types of behaviors. So the hunter, we want that person to really be out pushing and driving for new business. And and the, and the relationship developer, the, the farmer, we want building relationships and and having the patience maybe to work through a longer term process. So in situations where you see more hunting as a strategy, or you see more transactional sales processes that are faster cycle, you'll tend to see more aggressive pay mix than in situations where you want more relationship building, account management. Maybe you have more people involved in the sales process, so it's a more complex sales process. You'll tend to see a little bit shallower pay mixes. And then if you went to more service delivery roles, you might see something that might be an 80-20 or a 90-10, again, promoting that kind of that kind of behavior. So getting those right on a relative basis and according to the market is super important because it's a big driver of behavior. Absolutely, Mark. Beautifully said. And so 
let's take a little bit step further uh, for in a sales organization let's go up the, the ladder a little bit a sales manager or a chief revenue officer what what type of where, where would you expect the kind of weighting to be would it be more in fixed or more an incentive how, how, how would you describe as you start to go into a more of a managerial or administrative right. function, what would happen right so as, as you're moving up you'll you usually see the pay mix uh become a little less aggressive um but you may see more upside as well and you're also going to see higher you're going to see higher actual base salaries so you may see a chief commercial officer chief revenue officer with a 60 40 pay mix you could very easily see that but their base salary would be significant uh so it doesn't it's not the kind of 60 40 mix that maybe a rep would feel where the where the pay the actual dollar pay levels are much lower um and and as i mentioned you may actually have more upside for that chief revenue officer uh, but you still want them to have a lot of skin in the game now there also is a question at some level and it's usually the, the chief revenue officer level where the question is should they be on some type of sales incentive plan or should they be moving or over to more of an executive uh compensation plan right and that's debatable so companies you know different companies do that differently uh, i i like to see a situation where maybe it could be a combination but at least the chief revenue officer has a really strong tie to uh, performance, the revenue performance, or whatever the key measures are in the sales organization. So you do want to see that thread going up, but um, yeah, so that so th those things will change as you go up the up the line in terms of seniority. Perfect, perfect. Okay, and so in your example, Mark, the hundred thousand sixty base, let's say forty incentive. How do I now start to think of the forty thousand, and how do I start to attach performance measures there? And potentially KPIs because that's now now right. we drive that behavior on the on the urgency and the incentive side. How do I go about doing that? Right. So for your so that's where we're gonna that that incentive piece that target incentive piece. That's where you're gonna start to look at those C level goals. And and what I like to do is ask the basic question: If we were able to articulate what the C level goals are of the organization, of those C level goals, which of those goals does this particular sales role? Um, have responsibility for and, and control over. So for example, if we said, well, revenue, okay, well, that makes sense. Uh, if we said, uh, you know, certain priority products, strategic products, that could make sense. If we said profitability, then I would ask the question, okay, well, what kind of profit is that? Uh, well, you know, net income is a priority for the business. Oh, okay. Wait a second. Net income, uh, there may be some influence that the salesperson has, but they have very minimal because they're selling, right? Um, if you said operating income, well, still, the operating income is driven by other costs. If you said uh, gross profit or gross margin, I might say, okay, well, a salesperson could have control over gross profit or gross margin if they have control <clears throat> over the inputs to that, which in most sales situations would be pricing. So if a salesperson has control over pricing, then we could measure them on gross profit. So you, you got to have to ask, ask that question, what's important? And then what do they control? Because you don't want to measure a salesperson on, on what they can't control. And profit, the reason I bring up that example on profit, that tends to be a really hot one, is measuring people on profitability when in fact they don't, they don't have pricing control or they don't, they don't have you know, control over other factors. Uh, there, there could be other surrogates for profitability, such as uh, product mix, so they're more, you know, more profitable products that could be a surrogate. And you could also have what we call price realization. So we might say, well, they don't have pricing. Uh, I'm sorry, they don't have uh, profit control, but they can, but they can uh, try to get to a certain target price. And so, and the reason there, you might look at something like price realization is when you measure profit, you then have to report profit. You have to tell them what their profit is. So some companies may not have a clear measure on profit. That tends to be the big debate that we can't track it. Um, some companies may not want to disclose what their profit is. So if you're like a distributor, as an example, sometimes what we'll do is we'll put in a, uh, a standard cost. So then above that standard cost or, you know, is called profit or we can do price realization. So how close did you come to the target price that we set for you? So C-level goals and what, what, do the, what does that job control the C-level goals? 
then within that, I would ask the question of priority. So if we said, well, revenue is important and bookings is important, but we don't want to get we want to get the actual revenue, and then profitability is important. Okay, so we got three things that are really important. Well, which one is the most important, and how do you divide those up? So a couple of principles is you don't want to have any more than three performance measures in a plan. And you don't want to have any measure with, say, less than 15 or 20 percent weight. OK, so it starts to narrow you in a little bit because you want each measure to be significant in terms of influence. And so then you have to say, OK, which one is the most important and how do I prioritize these so that I'm putting them in the right order? Uh, so we're trying to just make the plan focused. We're trying to be clear about communications. We don't want to create what I call a buffet plan where we have too many measures and people just kind of go down the buffet line and they go, well, you know, I like the green jello. I don't like the roast beef. And they're like, well, yeah, but we really want you to sell roast beef. No. And so you don't, you don't want to give too many choices. You want to make it super clear what you want them to focus on. And on that point, um, Mark, I'm going to digress a little bit. I'm going to come back to these performance measures. How important is it to make the compensation plan simple? I, 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 I've always been taught that if you're going to get the best out of sales folks, they should be able to get a calculator or a napkin and really kind of calculate how much their pay is going to be next week or the week after that based on, you know, performance mm -hmm. measure incentives. How important is it to be simple? Well, I think I think what you're saying is true. I and mean, that's an old adage, but I think it holds true that um, <laughs> if somebody can't see or have what we call line of sight between what they do and what they're going to earn, that starts to break down the communication. And like I said before, that I think that's an important way for people to think about comp sales compensation programs is they are, are a communication tool. And so if you're not being clear about the message, you're breaking down the power of that tool. And so you're, you're not being clear. Um, you um, uh, also are dealing with one of the great kind of paradoxes or ironies of sales compensation is that you put all this work into it and you spend months on it with the team. And if you come out and you say, well, there are just two measures and one's going to pay on this, this uh, commission rate and the other's going to pay on that commission rate. You go, wow, it took, took you months to figure that out. Well, that's one of the great ironies is that after you go through all this work, the simple solution is actually the better solution in the end. So just because you do all this work doesn't mean you have to show all your work at the end compensation program, right? So, so that, that's one of the hard things I think for teams to deal with is, is wanting to show that work. And also, I think one of the uh, the um, the pitfalls in terms of the simplicity is sales comp programs are usually designed by people who are very smart. And the thing is, they can design complex things. They can, you know, create a remote control device called the sales compensation program that tries to direct everything. And and so the temptation is to to try to include as much as, as you can in there. So. One of the tests I would use, so we talked about measures, three or fewer measures. One of the tests I would I would use is, what is this, uh, in terms of these measures, what do we actually have to uh, pay for versus what do we actually have to manage to or should be managed to? Meaning we want to get to the results, we should pay for results and you should manage to perform to the the input or the or the performance that goes into those results and that's why we have these people called sales managers because they manage the team right so some of that should be pushed off to those sales managers which will allow us to simplify the plan got it okay all right and you mentioned a few kpis some hard numbers there mark and by the way at some point we're going to get into the role of finance and maybe other functional areas in sales compensation design, uh, which is going to be an interesting conversation. But um, what about basing um, some of these incentives on activities rather than sales? For example, you, you, you mentioned number of bookings or potentially number of calls. What's your view on that? Yeah, so, so the, the, the general um, philosophy, which I, I agree with, is, is you, pay, you uh, pay, pay for results and you manage two activities. So that is the general philosophy, which tends to make most sense. Uh, one of the reasons is because you get what you pay for. So if I'm paying for activities and I'm paying for, say, more proposals or more sales calls or whatever it might be, you can pretty much guarantee you're going to get more proposals and more sales calls because people can generate that. 
but you don't know if you're actually going to get the results you're looking for out of that. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that you can't have something in the plan that has milestones in it if absolutely necessary. So uh, so let's talk about the, the, the level of performance measures because this will kind of simplify it a little bit. So when you think about kind of the hierarchy or level of performance measures, at the very top, you're going to have financial measures. Right? Yeah. So those are the measures that are show up on, on you know, the income statements. Uh, so it's going to be revenue. It's going to be bookings. It's going to be um, uh, profit dollars or, or, or profit margin. Uh, it could be units, depending on the type of business you're in. So those are the absolute results. So if you could pick one category to use, that's the category you'd want, which are your financial measures. The next level down are strategic measures. So you might call them customer measures. So they basically say, we want you to get the financial measures, but we want you to do it in a certain way. So we want you to get a certain number or amount or percentage of new customers, or we want you to sell certain types of products. So if you think of the financial measures, they're kind of like an accelerator in a car, right? So faster is better. Just give me more, right? And the strategic measures are kind of like a steering wheel. So it's basically saying, no, I want more, but I want it in certain directions. Okay. So if you had your choice of two types of measures, those are the, those are what you would pick from in the hierarchy. Then you start to get down a little bit further and you get into the next level, which would be milestones or leading indicators. So number of sales calls, proposals, uh, things of that nature. Those are the ones we generally want to back off on unless we come out and measure something in those top two measures or those, those things have to be uh, supplemented in some way. Where you may want to consider those kind of measures, those activities or, or those, um, uh, th those input measures is in something like say a very long sales cycle. Uh, so a classic example is the semiconductor industry they pay on a thing called design wins. And a design win is when they say, it, it say it's, um, we'll pick a current one, so NVIDIA. So NVIDIA gets a design win with a, with a, uh, a hardware manufacturer, uh, an OEM, and then they're gonna have their chips put into that OEM. That's a design win, but there's not actually any revenue received at that design win. It's basically saying, we're gonna put you into the, this next release of whatever, whatever the hardware is, whatever the computers are. But but you're paying on the design wins because that's the big that's the big win uh, that will lead to revenue and there's a pretty hard contract usually that's going to lead to revenue so you can pay on that you may also pay on revenue when that comes in and you probably do in that case uh, another example would be the automotive industry uh, if you're selling uh, say wiring harnesses to uh, to GM well those when when you uh, get that design win there. Uh, that's not going to be uh, see revenue until they actually start to produce that vehicle, which may be in another year or so. You may also have different stages in the automotive business, like prototype stages and things like that. So if you have stages that are customer recognized as progress, sometimes you'll pay on those. But those are not usually the sole measures. But those are good reasons that you might use milestone measures. And then kind of at the bottom of the hierarchy, so we're talking about financial, we're talking about um, strategic. Uh, the, the milestones, the bottom level would be more of your objectives, like your MBOs or key sales objectives. So certain types of activities, training, doing certain things that are not significant um, steps in the sales process. Those are the ones that, that we usually don't want to use in the, in the plan just because they're too soft. And, and, and it's hard to measure them uh, and they become what I think of as pay delivery mechanisms. So very often it's hard for a manager to not give somebody at least some of that MBO. And so they end up just, you know, giving that pay. So again, sticking to the top of that hierarchy, if at all possible, the financial and strategic measures. Awesome. Wow. Wow. Well, well, well explained. That is, that is fantastic, Mark. Thank you so much for that. Um, going back to the determining commissions and, um, you know, other performance metrics, you mentioned performance thresholds and potentially even capping earnings. Say a little bit more about performance thresholds and should businesses cap earnings and in what instances should they cap earnings? Well, um, let's start with the with the thresholds. Um, threshold is, a, is an entry point into the plan. So that's when somebody starts to get paid uh, incentive compensation. Uh, threshold is usually related to what the minimum acceptable level of performance is that somebody would start to be paid for. 
And so usually if you see an account manager job, they'll have a current base of business, they'll have some, some current revenue. And so the threshold will usually be set at some level above that. Usually it's a percentage of, of quota. So it might be 70% of quota, 80% of quota, something like that, because they have a current base of business that they're, they're, um, they're managing. So you expect that there's going to be at least that. So what you're assuming is that the base salary is paying for the, the management of that, that current base of revenue. So that's why you would have a threshold in that case. Um, I, I use kind of a, a crude uh, metaphor called the bus protocol. And the bus pro protocol is a good test for, for threshold. There are actually a few of them. But um, it basically says if the rep was out on the street and got hit by a bus and didn't come back tomorrow, how much of their quota or their revenue would come in? You go, okay, well, that's kind of cruel. Well, yeah, okay, but it'll, say, it'll give you an answer. It's like, okay, with well, the account manager, uh, maybe 50% or 70% of that revenue would come in because it's recurring revenue and we've got existing customers. Okay, well, maybe that job should have a threshold because you know that, that revenue is going to come in anyway. So there's some minimum level of performance there. What about the hunter? Well, actually nothing would come in because the hunter actually has to go out and win every new dollar of sales. Oh, interesting. So maybe we don't have a threshold there. Maybe we have a very low threshold because each dollar of performance is significant. And also, by the way, as we talked about pay mix, the hunter has a more aggressive pay mix. So they actually have less base salary. So getting them started earlier actually uh, works quite well. So bus protocol is a good way to, to look at it. The mathematical way to look at it is um, in terms of uh, uh, percentiles. So usually the 10th percentile of performance is around where you're going to draw the threshold uh, and distribution. So that's that's a cross check with, uh, with the bus protocol. And then my third one is called fired. And that's basically exactly what it sounds like. It, it, what level of performance over a couple or three quarters would a rep be fired, right? And so you go, okay. So if you put those three ideas together, you get a pretty good sense of where a threshold might, might be. So that's threshold. Now on the pay cap or the upside, uh, that is one of the best ways to, to start a good debate in, in a compensation meeting is to pay should the plan be capped or not. Yes. Uh, I, I am not a fan of caps because I think caps are probably more demotivational, demotivational and more visual than anything. So if you go out and you interview sales reps and there's a cap on the plan, uh, one thing you'll hear from the reps is, oh yeah, we, we don't like the cap, right? And so you probe further because no reps like the cap. You probe further and you go, well, you know, have you ever hit the cap? And they'll be like, well, no, I've never hit the cap. I mean, have you seen anybody, know anybody that's hit the cap? Oh yeah, yeah, there was a guy last year that hit the cap or whatever. So it's not necessarily a situation that comes up all that often, but it's always on somebody's mind that the cap is sitting there, right? So psychologically, it's not a great thing. There are ways to get around the cap, which is you can do things like uh, regressive rates, which basically at a certain point, the plan starts to slow down a little bit. Uh, you can also uh, look at uh, where you're setting your excellence level. So there are other ways to get around it without having that, that cap sitting there. And so my, my other uh, uh, metaphor around caps is, is uh, free range chickens. Okay. And you're going to go, what do free range chickens have to do with pay caps? Okay. So there's a, there's a chicken and it's sitting in a cage and, and the bars on the cage represent the pay cap, right? And that chicken's not very motivated. It's not a free range chicken, right? And so it doesn't have good mental health. It's not very happy because it feels the limitations of that cage, right? If you take a free range chicken and you say, okay, free range chicken, he's out there, he's happy. Uh, he's still going to end up, you know, on the grocery store shelf, but he's happy and he's got to, you know, he's, he's performing well. He's going to, he's going to be much higher quality than, than, the, than, the, than, the, than the chicken or the rep who's caged up. But the reality is there's a fence out there somewhere, right? There are limitations, but that chicken doesn't feel those limitations, even though mathematically and from a performance standpoint, we know there are limitations. Uh, so, so, so that's kind of a good way to think about it. But some of the things I think about with caps is, okay, the way you should be modeling and designing your plan is so your cost of sales is, is only going up nominally, um, is, is you're going to those excellence levels, you know, above where a cap might be, or it could actually be decreasing. 
Or, you know, from your CFO standpoint, you may say, well, I'm actually happy with the cost of sales going up. I'm totally fine with that because the profit margins we're seeing on those additional sales are actually, you know, multiples more in covering that. So I'm totally fine with that. So you can, you can model your way to not having to have a cap, and then you can create something that's going to be psychologically uh, a lot more motivating. And then you get stories, right? You get hero stories where people hit big numbers and then people want to work for your organization because you know, you're the organization that's paying well on the upside. So, uh, so there are many ways around caps, but I'm not a big fan just, you know, for the reasons I, I described. I'm completely in your camp, Mark, even as a, even as a CFO for decades. I, think. <laughs> I don't like caps. If you've got a, a driver and there's a significant ROI, I, why put a cap? I would stroke million dollar checks every day. Just so you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if you're in the majority of, C, of CFOs or not, but yeah, I think, I think, I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> and, and so on that point, what I did learn, again, with your counsel uh, a decade or so ago was uh, the concept of leveraging. So to your example of, you know, 100,000, 60 on base and maybe 40 on incentives, you know, the star performer, there's a leverage impact. And I think uh, when when we had our conversation, it was 3X. And I don't know if that even still holds now. That's typically 3X times the incentive, right? And so a star performer could probably make about 180,000. That's 60 plus 3X the 40, you know? And mm -hmm. you add those two for a total comp. So that is actually a nice dangling carrot for someone who is motivated and has got the skill set to drive the sales, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And um, your your three X includes, uh, and it's so what you have to be careful on on the upside is is the definition first of all. So your three X includes the target incentive. So you're saying in your example, sixty thousand dollars, forty thousand dollars of the target incentive, yes. and three X meaning you get another forty and a forty on top of that at the right. top. So three forties basically. Yes, that's okay, right. So yes. one eighty. Yeah. So there's there's two um, technical terms to watch out for here. Uh, which is the 3x or what we'd call leverage. So that'd be called like three times your 3x leverage, uh, which includes the target incentive. And then the ups, then, then what we'd call upside potential. So uh, that same thing you just described would be called 200% uh, upside potential. So you can make 200% of your 40,000 on the upside. So uh, the reason I mentioned that is, is terms get thrown around a lot. So being careful, are you including the incentive or not including the incentive? Okay. So then let's go back to the, the human behavioral question, which is the reason you're doing that goes back to the discussion we had before, which is around pay mix. And so it's a risk reward equation. So you'd go, well, why would the hunter have a 50-50 plan and, and the farmer has a 70-30 plan? Why would the hunter even accept that? Well, because you're going to give that hunter more upside. And the hunter feels like they have control and they do have control. And so they get higher reward for having higher risk. So that ratio you talked about, that 3x, uh, largely depends on the industry and it depends on your margins. So if you have, if you if you're turning good margins and you're an industry that's paying that, you almost have to do that to be competitive. Uh, you're going to see different multiples. So there's not an across the board uh, answer for every industry, but you're going to see different multiples in distribution. Uh, which maybe has lower margins, you're not going to see as much upside or maybe manufacturing. Uh, but in high tech, as an example, you'll see more upside because the margins are, uh, or software in particular, uh, margins are much uh, uh, stronger in software. So you'll, you'll tend to see higher multiples in terms of the upside. Got it. Got it. Okay. On that point, my, my wheels are turning now. Mark, in your experience, if we look, just look at Belka, we all want the superstars. Uh, we don't want the laggards. But right. if you just looked at Belka, what's your experience, Mark, in terms of the general weighting of those who are like the core performers, the average performers, compared to the leaders and compared to laggards? How would you, just from your years of experience, how would you break out what that bell curve looks like? Yeah, yeah. It's... um. Typically, you're going to want to have 50 to 70 percent of people at or above quota. Yeah, uh, it's just a general rule of thumb. We'll talk about why in a second. Uh, you usually have your top 10 percent. That 90th percentile will usually be 
where you start to hit that excellence level. So if you said I have a 3X plan, usually it's going to be around the 90th percentile that you would get into that level. 3X is usually not like the max. Uh, and then as I mentioned before, you know, the, the bottom 10% usually is your, your threshold performers, uh, which leaves you kind of that, you know, it's probably, you know, it's, it's that middle 60% or so, what I call the mighty middle that are going to be pivotal to the organization. So where we can have a plan that has really great upside, if you think about it, that's going to be really, um, uh, it, that's going to motivate people to, to be in the organization and, and, to, and to perform hopefully, but it's really only gonna pay that top 10% of people. So the way I think about it is that mighty middle group in, that, in the middle of that bell curve is the group that you wanna make sure is motivated to continue to push up incrementally because even small movements in that mighty middle group can have a big impact on the business. And then you might think of the question, you know, I talked about why, on why would you want 50 to 70 percent of people at or above quota um one is for predictability or, or better likelihood that you're going to hit the plan as a business so it, in you know based on how you're modeling the plan uh but if you have 50 to 70 percent at or above quota your odds of actually being on target or being on plan for the business uh, go up and um from a motivational standpoint it's very important as well because uh, I remember this one head of sales said, he said, I, he said, I only want like 30% of people are at or above quota. And I'm like, well, why is that? And he goes, well, I want it to be a really special accomplishment. I'm like, okay, well, that means 70% of your people feel like losers. Like they don't feel like they're good performers and, and salespeople, you know, travel on their optimism, right? You want salespeople to feel successful. So it's good to have people uh, at or above quota. That's a good, healthy, you know, psychological thing. Uh, and the other is cost of sales. So again, from a CFO standpoint, if you have a if you have a, a plan with great accelerators in it, and you have kind of a lopsided performance distribution, and you have a small number of people carrying the organization and getting its goal, and a lot of the people aren't hitting quota, you're hitting a lot of accelerators, which are probably going to accelerate your cost of sales, and that's going to throw it off as well. So a, a number of reasons, but yeah, you want to have fi probably fifty to seventy percent at or above quote as a, as a rule of thumb. Got it. Got it. Okay. And Mark on the, the big question, setting quotas, what's your, yeah. what are your one or two or three wisdom bites about how, how companies should be going about setting quotas? Well, you don't want to use history alone uh, because history is really looking backward to try to look forward and, and, probably 45% of companies somewhere in that range use history in their quota setting. And so what that can lead to is a performance penalty, which is basically if you do well one period or one year, you're going to get an increasingly higher quota, which makes it harder to attain that goal. So you keep you know, getting a higher goal for being a great performer. And so you'll start to see behaviors around that and, and and i've seen some funny performance distributions talking about performance distributions where you don't get a lot of people above quota but you get a bunch of people that are in that 90 to 100 percent range and the reason is not that they're not motivated to get to quota or not that the plan isn't a great plan but they realize when they get above 100 percent they're actually going to get a bigger quota next year and what they've done is they figured out how to optimize their earnings over multiple years. So if you just come in in a certain area, then your quota is going to be reasonable for the next year or for the next period. And so people will start to game that, that performance penalty. So uh, one piece of advice then is don't use history alone. Uh, the other piece of advice is you want to put together two components, the really important components, which are balancing market opportunity with sales capacity. So number one, market opportunity, too often we're looking at history and that becomes our, our surrogate for market opportunity. But market opportunity is what's available, available to us out there and what kind of indicators do we have that tell us what the potential might be. It could be, you know, depending on your business, it could be looking at a um, uh, number of companies and, and at the company level, it might be looking at headcount of the company or revenue. Or if you're in the, uh, say, I'll give you a couple of examples. If you're in the in the office products business, you might look at number of white collar workers at the company location 
because that's an indicator of usage of office supplies in terms of consumables and, and business furniture and, and machines and those type of things. Uh, if you're in the logistics business, you might be looking at square footage of warehouse space, or you might be looking at number of trucks and fleet, right? So what tells us what the potential is of the market opportunity? And in the sales capacity side basically says, I can't give everybody a huge goal unless they actually have the capacity or we have the capacity as an organization to hit that goal. So sales capacity basically says, what kind of headcount do we have? What kind of time allocation do they have to actually go after that goal? Because people on average spend about only 50% of their time selling. So are their jobs you know, clean enough and decontaminated enough from other things that they have time to do that? Uh, what kind of talent do I have? What's the workload and how long does it take to close a deal or manage a current customer? So balancing those two components, and I won't go into quota methods here, but balancing those two components will tell you a lot about opportunity and sales capacity. And then you can balance that to come up to, you know, a better answer of what your, what your quota should be. Got it. Okay. All right. Fabulous. Um, we, we're talking about cold, hard cash in terms of compensation design. What should businesses be thinking about, Mark, when they're thinking about designing a comprehensive comp plan? It can it can include other things other than, you know, an incentive check or a base pay, et cetera. What other components should we be thinking about? Well, I think very often when we ask the question, what are salespeople motivated by? One of the first answers is money or incentive, right? But I think you look to answer your question, you look at what the other motivators are. The other big motivators for salespeople are uh, a sense of accomplishment, um, you know, working with the customer, solving problems, winning, um, you know, sense of sense of independence, lifestyle. So there are a lot of other motivators to draw upon that can play into not just the sales comp plan, but other reward and recognition. So when you take those ideas and you, you say, well, okay, well, what does that mean? You might look at uh, contests. So contests draw upon the idea of competition. Um, that's a motivator. And it also makes results public so that I don't want to be at the bottom of the pack. I need to be at the middle, middle of the pack or above, right? Yeah. So so that, that becomes very motivational. Um, you could have... Uh, uh, other types of um, uh, attainment around shorter term goals. So uh, SPIFs is an example. So we want to get to certain product goals or certain, you know, fast start or fast finish goals. Uh, we uh, uh, might motivate around and you think about the kind of rewards that might go with these things. So you've got recognition, as I mentioned, with, uh, with contests. Uh, you might also go for non-cash rewards, like you mentioned, because the power of non-cash can be very strong because people will do more very often to earn, you know, a certain number of airline points than they will to earn the dollar equivalent in cash, right? Because they're going to use that. They, they, they visualize something different. They're going to use that for something. They're going to use it for, for vacation. They're going to use it for their family. So the types of rewards you're looking at, um, if, you, if you go non-cash, can be very powerful if they have to do with things like uh, experiences, uh, trips, uh, President's Club obviously can be a big one as long as we're not weighing the meeting down with with uh, weighing the trip down with too many meetings. We we're just on a call with a, with a client just a few minutes ago actually on that, which is yeah, President's Club. But we 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 had you know three days of meetings and nobody was very excited about President's Club because we were in Hawaii and all we did was sit in the conference room, right? Uh, uh, other other things uh, services that engage the significant other. Okay, so think about a sales person, whether if it's if it's a man or a woman, if you have things that are that are received at home, like maybe it's some type of home services or something that's a reward, that can be nice. Um, so anything where you can engage the significant other or the spouse, that that can be important. So trips do that, but home services do that as well. We kind of joke about, you know, the 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 lawn service or the pool boy or whatever it might be, you know. <laughs> But but trying to reach beyond and, and, and get beyond just just the salesperson themselves can be very effective too. I love your point earlier, Mark, about you know just the sales DNA. And what I found worked in my experience many times, sometimes it doesn't, um, is publishing the league table because they like to win and they don't want to be at the bottom 
of the pack. <laughs> and it's amazing. It's amazing the fun you can have and the, you know, the, the natural competition is just fantastic. So I think that's super it's one of the most powerful things you can do. Yeah, just natural competition. It's like it's like when you're doing the uh you know the NCAA uh pool. It's like everybody wants to win. So posting the results, yeah, that, that make a big make a big difference. Absolutely. And so you mentioned um, a couple of things really about designing sales comp around, you know, product and market complexity and also the length of sales cycle. Just a couple of wisdom bites there, Mark, on, <laughs> on considering those two, how would that potentially influence or change the way you're structuring your, your comp design? Well, um, product and market complexity and sales sales cycle, length of sales cycle, let's take those so in general, the more complex the, the, the product or the market situation, okay, so more complex the product. So if it's much more consultative, much more technical uh, market, if the market involves multiple buyers in a situation, uh, those kind of situations will actually, uh, that'll, that'll usually influence the pay mix which means that you usually have a less aggressive mix with uh, with a larger base salary because it because it takes it takes time to go through those things because you have to have multiple people involved because the influence of the individual is not as high just as a person they're relying on, on many other people um, whereas if you took it in the other direction you said well it's much simpler product single decision maker right then you can move more toward, a, a more aggressive mix. You might have more incentive because the individual has greater control. The cycle, the, and, and, and when you mentioned cycle, same kind of thing, longer sales cycle, longer sales process will tend to be shallower pay mix than faster sales process, more transactional sales process. So those, those play right into it. We, uh, we have a tool we call pay mix uh, positioner that's in, in the book, what your CEO needs to know about sales compensation. And it's got about eight different factors in it. You can basically take a job and you can score the job based on these factors. And it'll give you an approximation of what the mix should be like based on those factors. And where that can be really valuable is positioning it relative to other jobs in that you're looking at. And it can also be very valuable if you're working with a team because each person can put it in their interpretation of what they think those different job factors are. And if they're coming out to a different pay mix, and, and sometimes you'll get an indication right away. It's like people will not agree on what the payment should be. You'll say, okay, let's do this exercise. Well, what you'll find is their assumptions about what the job is doing may actually be different. Or if they're from different parts of the business or different regions, they may actually treat the jobs differently. They may be doing different jobs. So that can help you find things that maybe are inconsistent in terms of the assumptions behind the job. Right. Okay, no, brilliant. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, Communication and the legal and administrative considerations. I've seen, you know, unclear communication in terms of rolling out sales company can demotivate sales forces. I've seen some of this stuff because it hasn't been properly documented or tested and rolled out appropriately lead to legal issues. Mm -hmm. Just share a couple of wisdom bites about getting those two aspects of a sales plan correct. Well, on implementing a plan not necessarily with a new structure, but with new measures. Let's go back to profit, for example. Okay, this year we're going to measure profit because that's going to be, you know, that's that's a super important priority. But the fact is we've never actually measured profit accurately as a business, or at least not down to the territory level. Um, the rule of thumb is do not put a new measure in a plan unless you've actually operated uh, with that measure for at least a year outside of the plan okay because then you're just you're introducing all sorts of risk um on legal issues i think having a strong governance document and strong uh clear policy it, i mean it's an obvious statement but that that's extremely important i think of i think of the, the the governance or the policies as the constitution of the compensation plan so uh which means the Constitution guides our decisions. The Constitution also has amendments because uh, you're going to have this thing called a compensation committee. And if things get escalated to the compensation committee, 
they're going and, and they're not covered by the the document itself, um, the policies. They're going to have to make decisions, and those decisions then create precedent for what you're going to do in the future. And those decisions can also be become amendments that you put into the document. So process is a really important part, especially from a, a legal standpoint. Also setting thresholds for those exceptions. So if people are coming back with all sorts of pay questions, well, it might, number one, indicate that your plan is not very clear, but there's a certain level where those kind of things should be handled, uh, you know, disputes either handled uh, or just taken care of automatically if they're below a certain threshold or handled at the manager level so that so everything is not coming up to for review. Um, on communication, I'll just make a couple of points there. I've seen plans that are well designed not go well because they weren't clearly communicated or clearly implemented. But communication uh, can be a, a, a big, or lack of communication can be a big culprit. And communication is not a one-time event. It's not just introducing the plan at the sales meeting uh, and, and saying, okay, good luck, and you know, handing out the FAQ document. Uh, the best communication you can do is as a campaign. So I think about it, and I'm always trying to find, you know, comparisons and, and analogies in other places, but think about it like an advertising campaign. So if I'm going to do a good communication program or campaign, what I want to do is I want to, first of all, identify what the big messages are that I want to get across. Because everybody, when they look at the comp plan, they're going to see each component, they're going to either see it as a positive, a negative, or a neutral, right? So what are the big messages I want to get across? And what are the audiences? Who are the audiences that I need to communicate to? And you might say, well, we got the sales organization. Well, that's not the audience. You may have people of different tenure levels, different geographies, different roles, uh, different situations. You may have different audiences that have different things they need to hear. Next thing I would ask is, what are your proof sources behind your messages? So uh, if you said, the plan is competitive, you know, that's one of our messages here. We have a more competitive plan. Well, prove it to me. Okay, so what are you going to do to back that up to explain that to people and, and why it's more competitive? Uh, and then you have to get to the question of um, what are the vehicles that we're going to use? So it's not just a presentation at the sales meeting. You may be doing things like, uh, of course, FAQs. You may have income planners for the, the tactile learners, the, the mathematical learners, the people that actually want to see how it works. Uh, you may have things like animated short video that explain the plan in two minutes. Or maybe you have a series of those that explain the plan consistently. Um, and you may have lunch and learns, right? So there may be a number of things that you do. And then you're going to you're gonna have a schedule. So you're going to have a, a schedule for how this happens over a period of time. Usually the first six months, you know, maybe longer. So the campaign is just extremely important. And I think companies shortcut it because they go, yeah, people understand it. And I've seen really simple comp plans that half the organization doesn't understand uh, because it wasn't communicated clearly, or maybe one part of the country communicated it differently than another part, and then one part got it and the other part didn't. So you can't underemphasize the importance of communications. These are tremendous wisdom bites. The, 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 this is a treasure <laughs> trove of nuggets. This is just fantastic, Mark. I'm, I'm, I'm listening to everything you say, it's fantastic. Thank you. All right, the final stretch. All right, we're gonna have some some quick fire questions here. What is the biggest mistake that businesses make when designing sales compensation? Biggest mistake, um, I would say it's um, it's probably uh, complexity. You know, unclear message. Unclear messaging. Okay. All right. How do you know when your sales compensation design is working? How do you know when it's working? When um, the results you're getting are aligned to those C-level goals. So if you're hitting the revenue or whatever the financial measures are, you're hitting them in the right direction in terms of what markets and what, what offers and what products we're, we're trying to focus on. Um, that's that's usually a, a, a good indicator. Um, I'll just leave a short answer on that. Awesome. Okay, no worries. All right, stage of growth company life cycles. Um, how does stage of growth impact compensation plans? Well, yeah, the stage of growth. So if you go from startup to volume growth to um, uh, more optimization, uh, it, it, thing, things are going to change in terms of the priorities of the business and how the business operates. 
the, the organization itself is going to change and the plan is going to change. It's a very simple example. When you're in an early stage or volume growth stage, you may have a single type of sales role. You may, uh, for simplicity, have paid that sales role on a commission plan. And uh, maybe it was a single rate commission plan. And then as you got to that next stage where you started to get more into uh, uh, maybe a more mature level of, of business, you start saying, well, you know, we're actually segmenting differently. We're looking at our customers differently. Um, you know what? We actually don't have just one sales job anymore. We actually have uh, sales uh, sales support people. We, we have systems engineers, whatever it might be, that are supporting that salesperson. We've got strategic account people, right? So the organization becomes more complex. The plan itself has to evolve. Also, in those earlier stages, when you're paying just a single commission rate, um, we didn't have a lot of customers, right? So since then, we've built up customers. We have a base of customers and, and, and reoccurring business. And so that single commission pl plan is now paying people for business that they've won a few years ago. And so it starts to become an annuity plan and it's no longer associated with hitting goal because they're managing you know, accounts. So, so as the things change in terms of the structure of the sales team, the compensation plan has to follow that. And a lot of times that's where you see a breakdown is that you have old plans with new types of sales rules and there, there's kind of a conflict between the two. Got it, got it. And so you touch on an interesting point mark around let's talk a little bit about the tech industry how well does the tech startup the, the startup tech industry fear when it comes to designing sales compensation effective sales compensation well i think if they're in the startup phase what they're probably doing is they're either they early early stage they're probably using could be using channel partners or agents or people that maybe hired guns, right? And so they're just paying them if they sell based on what they sell or if they sell. Uh, they're probably starting off with, with hired salespeople. They're probably starting off with um, people who are on a draw perhaps or a very small salary and commission. Uh, so I think in the early stage, they're doing what startups should do, which is they're trying to get business and survive. So the inclination is going to be to keep fixed costs at a minimum and make as much of it variable and reward people on the upside. And you'll certainly see in early stage tech uh, stock options. So that's another big motivator, even if people aren't making a lot in cash, right? So so the, the, you know, the priority for those early stage companies is survival and minimize fixed costs and minimize cash outlay and, and, and really sell people on the upside, the potential for what they can, they can earn. So, um, you know, I, I have a hard time kind of making a across the board evaluation of all early stage, but that tends to be what you'll see being done. Got it. Okay. All right. How should the financial organization be involved in um, designing sales compensation? Um, typically, what we'll see is articulation of priorities around financial priorities. Um, be involved with how the plan is going to pay out in a fiscally responsible way. So where we see the finance organization getting most involved is when we start saying, okay, here's what we think the plan is going to look like and how, and how the money is attached to the plan. And the CFO will usually be in or whoever the, the right financial person is will be involved to say, okay, well, what's the cost of sales at Target? What do the distributions look like if we have different performance distributions? What happens on the upside? We'll have the conversations that we had a while back, which is, is the CFO or the finance organization comfortable with paying 3X on the upside? And, and a lot of the CFOs are. A lot of them are like, hey, that's great. And, and I can see where that, that works for us. Um, where I think it can be difficult is if the finance organization has a bias toward uh, why does the sales organization get paid so much, right? right? So if it's an enlightened finance organization and they get it, then it works really, really well. But it's usually not in the beginning stages of the design. It's usually when, when the dollars start coming into play that we see most finance organizations getting involved. And then in a quota setting as well. So when we have the goals, uh, finance is representing what the, what the business needs to accomplish and, um, and, and, and helping with, the allocation of that to some degree, 
right? So to some degree means sales and sales operations need to get involved with, well, okay, finance gave us, gave us, or, or, or the, you know, the, the board and finance was involved gave us this onerous goal. So how are we going to distribute the pain, pain to the whole organization, right? So so, so, uh, so sales ops and, and sales needs to be involved with, okay, here's the method we're going to use. Like I said, market opportunity, sales capacity, picking the right quota setting method to allocate. So you've got quota setting at the highest level, then you've got the allocation of that goal all the way down to the front line. And then the roll up of that, right? And the reconciliation, did all the frontline goals match what we need as a business? And well, did we over allocate to some degree? Usually it's three to 5% from the front line to the CSO or the CRO level, or did we over allocate too much? Are we up into double digits of 10% or 20% over allocation where you get a separation of reality between the leadership of the business and the front line, which is what you, you have to be careful of that. Got it. Okay. All right. My penultimate question here is how should sales compensation design differ for core, elite, and laggard performers? Well, if you mean by core, elite, and laggard, the, the core being that mighty, mighty middle and the elite yes. being the high yeah. constant, yeah. Well, yeah, we, we kind of talked about some of those points that I think, you know, your core people are going to be, um, they're going to be uh, earning around that target total compensation level. But I would say as you're getting up to quota, you want to make sure that the plan is still pulling people up to getting to quota and getting over a quota. So you want to make it valuable for that person to reach quota in that core group so that they're there's so you want to motivate as much incremental performance as you can within that core group. So that you know that's a basic principle. Again, move the mighty middle a little bit and it, and it moves it a lot. For for the elite, um, you know, I, I you got to find the right multiple. Uh, for uh, uh, for your upside to make sure you're getting the kind of talent that you want. I won't say the best talent, but the best talent that you can get. That's that's what you want to you want to find with that elite group. And uh, and and your laggards. Okay, so I, I like to use what I call the reverse Robin Hood principle. So we'll talk about the elite and the laggards here. The reverse Robin Hood principle is you take from the underperformers and you reward the overperformers. You fund the overperformers. So. Optimally, you don't want those low performers earning more than, uh, you know, you got to find your right ratios, but earning um, more than they should for that level of performance. And a lot of this is going to be, and, and again, it's one of the interesting things about sales compensation is it's both mathematical and it's human and it's psychological, but part of it's going to be philosophical according to the, the, the company and the culture of the leadership team where if you say reverse Robin Hood principle, take from the underperformers and we're going to reward the, the high performers, most leadership teams will say, yeah, absolutely. Some companies will say, well, we want to be careful about that because we're a culture of inclusion and whatever. So you got to you got to understand what your culture is before you push too hard on some of these things as well. So I'd say it's got to be it's got to fit with your with your with your organization's culture. Are you a sales culture? Are you a finance culture? Are you an operations culture? You know, there are different types of cultures or some mix, but understanding that is going to be key. And some of the test questions you can ask are some of the things we already talked about, uh, which is uh, about upside performance. One of my, okay, should, should the plan have a cap? That's a good test question. And you get a visceral reaction to that. Should the plan have a threshold? The one I really love to ask is should the top performing salesperson in the organization be able to earn more? than the, the chief sales officer or the president of the company in a given year. You'll get an immediate reaction to that because some people will say, absolutely, that would be awesome, right? Others will say, are you kidding? Right. So you got to test the culture to know how you want to treat those three groups differently too. Brilliant, Mark. Last question. What is your parting advice for businesses when designing sales compensation? I think it's um, I think it's probably the three checkpoints I started with initially, which is be really clear about your C level priorities, your C level goals, and it's not just about the C level itself. It's about the leaders of the organization. So are they all aligned on what those priorities are? Because that's going to become your north star for the plan. So align to C level goals. 
understand context. So make sure you know how your plan is fitting in that enablement layer to support your upstream and down your upstream decisions. And then the final is, you know, use a logic based approach, what I call sales compensation diamond. And uh, that that's in the book. I don't, I don't know if we're going to be on video at all, but this absolutely. is a yes. the book, right? So, yes. so that's the diamond. So make sure you're being, you're covering all the bases in that diamond. Uh, and you'll also see the, the revenue roadmap in, in the book as well. So, yeah. um, Make sure you're you're covering all these areas because they lay out a very logic based approach to how you step through evaluating the plan and then how you step through designing the plan. So if you kind of use those three anchor points, sea level goals, revenue roadmap, and the sales compensation diamond, it will keep you on track in terms of your thinking process to go through this. So that guess that that'd be my parting advice is is, is use use some anchor points like that that'll be helpful in your problem solving. Mark, thank you so much. This has been tremendous. I'm well, great. so thank grateful you. that we've we reconnected. You're, you're the ultimate expert in this area. You're a great thought leader in this area. So I'm so thrilled. This is just fantastic. This is a ton of nuggets. Uh, this is a critical area that most businesses struggle with. Mark, we all know yeah. that, right? And so thank you for sharing your wisdom bites. It's, you're you're a very course. gracious person as always. And, and I really appreciate this session. Well, thank you, Richard. Thanks for having me, and I, and I appreciate it. It's always great catching up, and uh, it's it's a, it's a great topic. It's, it's a lot of fun to talk about, but as you mentioned at the outset, uh, very, very important for the organization to get right. Thank you so much, Mike. I appreciate it. All the very best to you, okay?